Contrary motion, right? Contrary motion. Contrary motion. If he had just done this, Right? That's the line. That's the sort of line that he has. But then he does, instead of doing that kind of parallel motion, all of a sudden we get a whole nother color. All right. So there's four kinds of motion. And when I say motion, just to sort of be super clear, we're kind of talking about it in a, although very specific way, also a general way. It can be motion between the outer voices of your chord. It could be motion between two voices. It could be motion between your lead synth and your vocals. It could be motion between your two lead synths, right? It really, it can be whatever your track is dealing with. It's not specific to the lead singer and a backup singer. It's really not specific to any of that. It can also be as sort of uh, vast as sort of thinking like my lead singer and maybe my bass. I'm going to kind of make sure I want my track to kind of be related that way, right? Maybe in a very general terms, I'm sort of always paying attention to how does my voice move to how does my bass move. Then my chords are doing sort of their own thing too. But it's, it's really however you want to look at it. But the motion and the four ways of motion, are, no matter how you look at it, it can be compared to the top note of your chord, to the melody, melody to bass, two sets of melody, two sets of lead uh, synths, it doesn't matter, okay? You can apply this to everything. Okay, so the first, the first one is uh, parallel, which we probably have all been using. Uh, it's kind of like passing tones. A lot of times people are using it all the time, they don't necessarily always know exactly what they're doing. So parallel is sort of... The essence of parallel is really just exactly what the its title is. Whichever way my lead is going could also be something like um, everything is moving in parallel motion. A lot of times with parallel motion, we get a lot of it in relation to chords and bass line. That tends to be the safe spot where people start with their bass line is they outline that root position, right? Um, so that's parallel motion, right? Everybody, this is moving up. Even if I have a chord, this is all moving down to A. So I'm saying parallel motion can be in it, comparatively to anything, but the point is is that there's something perfectly staying the same. You're getting parallel octaves, parallel third, parallel fifths, parallel sixths, whatever it is. Uh, parallel octaves and parallel thirds tend to be the most, I, I feel like I've run across them the most. Uh, parallel six also are very popular, especially in like strings and things. Thirds can sound tough. They can be very tight in strings. So instead of that, in classical, a lot of times we get open, more open. So from C to E, to just put the E, the C on top, you get the same notes, but they're inverted, so you get the six. Much better for strings versus, but all parallel motion, right? Everybody's going up, everybody's going down. Up one, down one, down one, up one, doesn't matter. It's all going. But parallel is just, it's, it gives a very... Uh, united feel to me. It gives a very sort of straightforward feel. I don't know how to say it. I don't want to say thin because I feel like it might have a funny connotation, but it, it just has this sort of like um, maybe simplistic, nice in a good, uh, everything in a good way, like a simple straightforward feel like those parallels just have a very thin, beautiful, like you really can see everything. It's very clear. Uh, so parallel motion is great for using kind of having those moments. Similar motion. Now this sort of piggybacks off of parallel motion. Similar motion, so parallel motion, if everybody was walking up, they walked up. If everybody jumped up a third, 
you jump up a third. Uh, so everybody was really literally moving the same amount of semitones, so to speak, right? In similar motion, it's everybody's either going up or everybody's going down, but you're allowed to now move a different amount of semitones. Somebody could move two semitones and somebody could move four semitones, six semitones. It doesn't have to match, but what has to match for similar motion is the direction, okay? Okay, so similar motion, we can have things like... So if I go up, instead of doing this, so this one is two semitones, this one, one, two, three. So then you could even jump more. So you can do whatever you want as long as everybody's moving up. We're moving up, moving up, moving up. Now I can move back down. Right? So that's nice. What's nice about this one is um, it provides another layer of color to me. Parallel feels like shades of red, right? Or multiple shades of blue. But to me, this is a very personal thing. You can totally disagree. Other people can see it differently. But for me personally, I feel like parallel motion is the same color but shades of it, right? Um, just lots of shades of different reds or different blues. Similar motion starts to have uh, a little bit of a different color because I'm getting these switches of intervals, right? And uh, switches of intervals are going to give different colors, right? So you may have a more, a smaller interval. It feels a little tighter, straightforward. You may open up to a six and all of a sudden it feels very ethereal. Then you could maybe go down to a fifth. I mean, you can play around how you get, so you're getting all the different intervals. In parallel motion, whatever interval, you're sort of sticking a little bit with that. Everybody might be moving differently, but they're all moving, whatever they start, they're moving in the same succession, so you're never going to get different amounts of uh, intervals, right? If you start with thirds, you're going to keep going in thirds. If you start with six, you're going to keep going with six. With similar motion, you could start with the sixth, go into a fifth, then up to a third. So you're getting all of these different colors, but the, 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 the flow of the melody or the flow of the whole track could maybe be going down and then everybody going up, but you can have these different colors, right? It's especially like too in like the bass line, you could have a different sense of motion with that by putting things in intervals. You know, you could have like, a, if we all are going up, Right, so from here, I'm going to both to my Fs, but this is a step, right? This is a fourth. So we get... So I'm kind of getting a similar motion with the bottom line and my ba or my bass, but it's different intervals. So I'm getting different colors now. Uh, so like I said, parallel motion, similar motion, they're relating to each other but one is getting different intervals, which is gonna bring uh, you know, more uh, different colors to it. There's gonna be times where that is not gonna work and your tracks are gonna be, um, maybe there's a lot going on in your track and having similar motion is gonna be like, whoa, that's just too much information. Let, let's let the lead really shine. Let's, but if we still want some harmony, let's just stick to thirds or sixths or something like that. Uh, and it will all of a sudden take the busyness out of your track and just make it like another color, but it'll it'll let everything shine. So, you know, it's not like one is better than the other. It's going to be very, very track specific, moment specific, uh, and they're both good. And what, what I want you kind of to take from it is when to use one and really when to use the other, right? So the similar motion is going to have a little bit more going on. So you have to make sure that there's not 1,800 things going on in your track, and then you have, like, let me put some similar motion in here and get some other stuff going. It's going to overload it, right? If you have all that stuff going on in your track, the better choice would be parallel. Um, also, you could, like, start your track out in parallel motion and have it just be very sort of straightforward and gentle in that parallel motion. And then uh, you could have it, like, round two, it comes back, and maybe it's similar motion. And that's the way your track progresses, is having a straightforward sort of parallel and then the second time I hear that same melody maybe you have similar motion and that's how I grasp onto the melody but I'll hear a slight change even though it's still like everyone going up someone of going down I'll get thirds and sixths and fourths and fifths and it's a beautiful way of kind of letting your melody kind of grow up a little bit and have a different form the second time we hear it.
Um, but yeah, no, beetles are amazing for harmony. And I actually should add some beetles to my motion examples. That would actually be a really good, that's a good, uh, that's a good thought. Chances are you probably wouldn't want to start with similar motion in your track and then all of a sudden go to parallel. It's going to be a little lackluster. It's better to start with a parallel motion and then throughout the track have a build of similar motion. It's going to, it's going to kind of be one more notch of, of, uh, something else to say a little more on top of your building. So you would want to progress that way, not the opposite way. So now oblique is, it's kind of like, it starts to kind of play around with the essence of a pedal point. It's not a pedal point by any means, um, but it starts to play around with that. So for instance, if we have, it's about keeping, if you think about these two lines, it's about something staying the same and something changing. So only one thing is changing at a time. Let's do, so if we have our D and our G, I'm gonna keep this G the same. I play it again. This one's walking up, this one's not following it. Before, parallel would be, right? Similar could be, I'm all going up. That would be our similar, but now oblique is when one is stay one is staying the same. This one's going up, this one's staying the same. Now I can make this one stay the same and this one go up. So I'll do then this one can stay the same. So it's about one thing moving at a time. This one moves up. This one moves up. This one moves down. And there's parallel. It's really it has what I the reason why I sort of say to, to to help memorize the oblique is it has that pedal point sense of that something staying the same, right? There's that oblique thing that's one is staying the same and one is going. Doesn't have to necessarily be a pedal point for like four measures, but it's about this motion of something staying the same. Then we could go up. Then I can go down. Keep this one the same. You can just circle around. So this is really nice if you're looking for sort of like a more of an unfolding sound. It can be very beautiful if you're trying to sort of unravel something. I feel like if you were kind of trying to um, have a lead melody, but you didn't necessarily want something going along with it in sort of like that perfect rhythmic motion. This kind of gives a slightly different rhythmic feel because something doesn't move. So it's kind of in our head feeling like instead of a, all these quarter notes, maybe this is a quarter note, but now this is a half note. Now this is a quarter note. Bach loves this a lot. It's big and classical. It's also just, I'm starting to see it's big, just like there's in a, they're in a lot of tracks, but it's a really nice way of sort of changing one thing at a time, but holding one thing changing this, now holding this, changing this, now holding this, and it gives a really beautiful sort of unfolding of things, you know? It could stay the same. So it's like, and this could stay the same. So it's, it's kind of just has this little bit of a different feel to it. So oblique is when one voice stays the same and one changes. Also, we could say, like, remember in our bass lines, how I, was, I think it was at the very end of the class, um, how I was saying, if you can find common tones in your bass line so that the bass line stays the same, that's what's creating oblique motion. So you could do, if I did, what I'm hearing is this to this or this to this, right? oblique motion so it can be between that chord and your bass line instead of doing right I'm doing very different feel different sound um, there's something that's like rooted right when that oblique motion doesn't when there's one voice that doesn't move there's something very rooting there right it's just holding the fort down so that's gonna have that feel know an example and like dead mouse like does that but i just couldn't i wanted to be more specific if i said it and i couldn't pull up something specific which is why i didn't but yeah so it is kind of like he has these kinds of notes that stay the same and and that's what kind of gives it this like unfolding 
And although it's not a specific, like a drone, just to be really specific, it's sort of holding for several measures why other things are going on, or two measures, right? So oblique motion is a drone, is a drone could be, the, a drone is in motion wise oblique, but sometimes oblique motion can be not as long as a drone, if that makes sense. But yeah, but that's what kind of gives this sort of uh, unfolding of things. Okay, so the last one is contrary motion. This sort of has, this is sort of where counterpoint starts to come out a little bit. The intervals are not following the same, they're not moving in the same direction, they're not moving in a similar direction, and they're not moving in, this one's really not moving, but this one is moving. Now, in contrary, it's the farthest from parallel, right? It's just the farthest point. Everything is going opposite. If, if my right hand goes up, my left hand has to go down. If my right hand goes down, my left hand has to go up. Contrary motion in voice is awesome. Like, it's amazing. It sounds so gorgeous. So we have like, we can walk out to, so it's basically just anything. You could jump back in. There we go. So it's whatever is moving opposite. If, the, if this melody is walking up, this melody has to walk down, has to go down. Um, in, uh, in some of the counterpoint rules, you're never allowed to pro approach an octave in parallel motion. So I could never go uh, like that. I'd have to approach it to that. So the thought of that is that parallel octaves they felt back then sounded very too thin and, and not supportive enough. So if you approach an octave in parallel motion, you're kind of getting that octave to octave. And they felt like it was too much. The rule became was that you had to approach the octave from the outer side. So if I'm going to my E's, I would have to do that. Or you could approach it from inside and going out. Uh, so that's sort of where that comes from. People have broken that rule 10 times over since. But that's sort of where that stuff starts to stem from. So we got parallel motion, everybody's moving in the same. Similar motion, people are all moving up or down, but we get different intervals now. Oblique motion, one guy's staying the same, one person's changing. Doesn't matter how it happened, what interval, but the interval is going to now change too because if you have your fourth and this one stays the same, we turn into a fifth, right? So you can have fun things of... of Right, that's oblique motion right there. So very film score kind of thing. Uh, then the farthest from it is contrary motion where everybody's just doing the exact opposite. You go right, I go left, you go left, I go right. It's cool, right? It, it really, you know, you can sit and read about counterpoint and get very much into the classical rules. It tends not to be as, you know, you, you just, in nowadays, we kind of break all those rules, but what I find to be the most important from the whole sort of study of counterpoint is this motion and paying attention to this motion. How does your bass and your uh, lead synth relate to each other? I think a lot of times we write lead synths or lead vocal lines and chord progressions, and then it's like, oh, okay, let me just throw in a bass line, let me just throw in this other stuff, and it can kind of just not be as tight as we could make it. And I find when people start to look at motion and how everything starts to fit together, the, the tracks are very tight. I mean, Dead Mouse, you know, you can just feel like all of their chord progressions and the way they voice them and the way the voicings comes out and the secondary melody lines that we get, it's not just like they slapped them in and was like, well, hope it works. Like, it's very crafted and you hear the bass is reacting. If the bass reacts to this sort of chord progression, with the top line of whatever your chord progression is, that's what's like all of a sudden the bass is sort of shining a mirror to that top line and we're hearing it tenfold. It's not just like we're hearing this melody and it's like, oh yeah, that's a pretty melody, okay. It becomes a much stronger melody when you create certain motion that's gonna kind of ricochet and sort of have this like shining light of like if you take a mirror and you shine the light right onto the side, like it's gonna have that like spotlight on it and all of a sudden, it has this musical compression feel, like where you kind of squished something and all of a sudden it's like popped out and now it's like 
you hear this little simple line in a completely different way. Um, and that's really what I, you know, with motion, I want you guys to just take is like, you really can take something simple and by adding a little extra and looking at motion, you really can dress up your track very quickly or dress it down. Maybe you're trying to have this different moment and, and you want it quiet, but you don't want it quiet and plain. You want it quiet and interesting. And I have a good one for that too on this. Um, you know, it's really, it's, it's about, you know, maybe using le less stuff and using what we have in a stronger way less instruments but really how do they relate well and let, let them shine and let them kind of interact in a way that's not like let me just add more trumpets and add more strings it's like no let me have one string one trumpet and how am I going to relate these guys so I don't run out of time let's go to so now I have a bunch of examples go through these examples and I kind of want you to try to figure out which one this is I mean clearly there might be a couple things going on but to see what the example is. This one's really. That one is a gorgeous one. Love that one. To just kind of piggyback on what I was saying a couple seconds ago. Sometimes you don't need a lot going on but by the, having the simple fact of a little contrary motion, this track is very sparse, right? But it kind of like, it always makes me want to cry and it always like kind of just feels like it just grabs your heart and just grabs you and you're kind of like fixated and it's like, it's very intense. It's, it's an amazing piece. It's a great one to study in the sense of just keeping things, how do you make something so powerful, but like, with not like saying, oh, I have to have all these drums and cymbals and this and this and this and this and this. It's like, you know, the art of sort of how do you make the most with the least. So they have, we start with our A and C. Now this one's going to go up to G. This one goes down to E. Contrary motion, right? Contrary motion. Contrary motion. So all of that is is it's the vibration is is going, it's it's fighting against each other. It's creating this energy, and that's why it's like even though this piece you kind of could look at it and be like, oh, it's a really calm piece. It's not calm at all. It's very it's it's got a lot of loaded baggage with it, and that's this counterpoint. If he had just done this. Right? That's the line. That's the sort of line that he has. But then he does, instead of doing that kind of parallel motion, all of a sudden we get a whole nother color. Just a totally different color. Now here he gives us one little moment, sort of, we get a little bit, he gives us, it sounds like he gives us this octave. So do you guys kind of see the power of counterpoint right there, or contrapuntal motion? Like, it's a game changer. <laughs> like, total game changer. Um, and he really, ha he really does this beautifully through the whole piece. If you guys have time, just listen to the whole piece. Just see how this kind of contrapuntal motion just keeps unfolding. And it really is at the heart of this. Like clearly he set out to have this, these two things happening and they're going kind of, this one's going this way, this one's going this way. Then they're kind of, looks like they're converging and they're coming together. This is going inward, this is going up, you know, this one's going downward, upward so that they would meet in the middle. But they don't keep meeting, and then this one goes this way, and this one goes this way. I mean, it just really has this, like, unfolding story that's so powerful. On to the next.
Okay, so one thing that I love about this is the track is very sparse, very sparse, very sparse. And then with that kind of that hook part that comes in, we get, um, let me go back to, that's our oblique, right? Similar motion, similar motion, oblique. So that's a good example of him kind of using a lot of this and to, personally, I find like, I mean, unless you know this song really well, just to pick up on Hugh's point of have, keeping it a little bit like good harmony should have a little bit of like that excitement of, you know, adding something. I feel like that harmony goes different places and unless you know it, you wouldn't necessarily expect it. It's not just like perfect parallel going anywhere, right? So we get. Then the next round of it. Oblique, right? Similar. So he's kind of really roaming it. And, and if he had just done. It's a great line. But to me, what makes it pop is this. Right? It's that to me I love. It just all of a sudden, do you feel like it took what is a good line and all, just made it like stupendous, like much more energy, it pops now, it has like a whole nother sense to it. So that's a really good one for that one. Okay, let me keep on moving. Let me find... So let me play that on the piano for you and then we'll listen to I'm gonna play the outer lines because it's the outer lines that we're looking at in terms of motion. I want you to see how the top line of that chord that we're hearing and that sort of bottom line of the bass that we're hearing. So we get, this one goes down, this one goes up. So that we get a nice sort of, So this one, you're getting, but it's so, it's dressed up so much by having the, right? Super beautiful. Right? So we've got, let's go back. So we got, we have uh, contrary motion, contrary motion. Now here's oblique. This one's going to stay the same. This one's going to go back and match it. Right? It's kind of a very pivotal moment for me in that piece. Similar, right? Going, this one's going to this. This one's jumping a little bit. Excuse me. Similar motion. This one's going back up, but this one's jumping a little bit. Cool. So this one has a lot of that, right? We've got... this night I mean those chords are very very juicy and amazing but we get this nice sort of uh, intensity to this so that's a great one questions about that did I miss a question uh, who had a question did I miss something uh, by the way I'm not quite sure the definition of counterpoint okay so counterpoint is like the study of motion it's the study of sort of like any, like just like the word counterpoint, like it, it's going in the opposite direction. It's the same, it's sort of a very similar thing of saying contrapuntal motion, like it's going opposite. But counterpoint um, comes with a lot of rules, comes with a lot of the study of counterpoint is like the study of how do you deal with parallel fifths? You're not allowed to have them. How do you deal with parallel octaves? You're not allowed to have them. So you have to approach them differently. And all of these rules of intervals and knowing how to write quote unquote music, they have these distinct rules of how, when you can move up in similar motion, when you can, you have to use counterpoint to go to the seventh, you can't jump, you have to have stepwise step. So it's almost like this gigantic puzzle 
of rules of and and what happens is is you end up getting a very specific sound like um you know that the sort of baroque era um it's if you followed all the rules today it probably would drive you crazy um i like some of the rules i'm sort of trying to highlight some of the ones i like uh however you know if you feel like having parallel octaves you should by all means do that so counterpoint comes with a lot of rules a lot of the rules are are really beneficial like a lot of them but just some of them you kind of have to uh, it's very applicable if you're trying to write a very certain kind of sound uh, I think otherwise it's best to kind of pick and choose what you like to learn more about next level sounds online music production courses please visit nextlevelsound.com